this first song that we sing is for you to stay seated and keep visiting or sing or do whatever. This is time for you to come in and uh, call to worship. We'd love if you sing along, but if you have to go talk to someone, go do it. It's fine. <clears throat> the humble and raise them high. You choose the weak and make them strong. You heal our brokenness inside and give us life. The same love that set the captives free. The same love that opened eyes to see is calling us all by that spread the heavens wide, the same God that was crucified is calling us all by name, you are calling us all by name. You take the faithless one aside and speak the words, you are mine, you Welcome here today. We're glad that you've come, whether you're here in person or joining us online or on the telephone. It's great that you've joined us. Did you notice the beauty of the earth this morning? The beauty of the trees? Who do you think God does that for? Who? Yeah, he does it for you and me so that we honor his name and glorify him. Today is Sunday, October the 9th. And the word of God that was written so long ago still applies today. After all, that's one of the many reasons that we gather together on a Sunday morning. To hear and better understand God's word. So we can live it more fully. Psalm 119 verse 37 says, Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. And verse 105 says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Let's pray. Lord God, this morning our hearts are full of thanksgiving for the beauty we see all around us. We thank you for the beautiful weather that we enjoyed here in this area this week. 
We are thankful for all who have joined us here. We're thankful for your word. We're thankful for those who faithfully study the word to help us better understand. We thank you today for the promise of wisdom for those who seek it. We also come asking from you today. We ask a blessing on those who have suffered great loss because of storms this week. We ask a blessing on those who are calling out to you for healing and for hope. We ask that our praise this morning would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We ask that your spirit would move in our midst today, that you would unleash your spirit on your people, that you would bind the evil powers of Satan so he has no power over us, and that your spirit would move in this place today. In Jesus' holy, powerful name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please stand with us and lift your voices. I just came to praise the Lord. number 67 number 67 for the beauty of the earth <clears throat> Thank you. 
worship him together.
He wants you to know him. Without him, we are undone. It's through him who we have abundant life. He is worthy of our praise. to bring you praise and honor and glory this morning. We invite you here in Jesus' holy name. Amen. You may be seated.
everyone for today's scripture reading i'll be reading out of first peter chapter 5 and i'll be reading verses 1 to 14 so first peter chapter 5 verses 1 to 14 the elders who are among you i exhort i'm a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed shepherd the flock of god which is among you serving as overseers not by compulsion but willingly not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor is being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you, be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves unto the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, our our faithful brother as I consider him, I have written to you to briefly exhort and testify that this is true grace of God in which you stand. See who is in Babylon. Elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. And with that, I'll bring up Brent for the message. Thank you, Kyle, and thank you to the rest of the praise team as well for leading us in worship this morning. It was an unforgettable conversation. Jesus had served Peter breakfast by the sea. Bread and fresh fish cooked over a fire. What a a joy it was to be with him, raised from the dead. Yet they had unfinished business. And I wonder, did Peter feel the weight of it? (laughs) Even as they talked, even as they shared that meal. Peter had once boasted about his loyalty. Even if everyone else deserts you, I never will, he said. Soon after, he disowned Jesus. In fear, he denied even knowing him. It's one of the most famous incidents in the life of Peter isn't it? And how bitterly he wept over his failure. Now Jesus is alive. Peter's glad, of course. But what does it all mean for their relationship? I invite you to turn to John 21. The Gospel of John, the last chapter, beginning in verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said, To Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And of course, we wonder, was he pointing to the the fish that they had this massive catch of fish, probably hadn't eaten them all? (laughs) Was he referring to Peter's old, old life? Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? I think it's a coincidence. Jesus asked this question three times, and Peter denied him three times. Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. What a privilege. So Peter has three decades 
of experience as a shepherd in the flock of Jesus by the time he writes to churches in what's now Turkey. He says to the elders among you. An elder is literally an older person. The New Testament, though, in the New Testament, the term elder often refers to a leader in the local church. Peter says, I appeal as a fellow elder. So as an apostle, Peter carried great authority, spiritual authority in the early church. But still, he doesn't set himself above these other leaders. He speaks to them as a co-elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who will also share in the glory to be revealed. So Peter saw the pain and death of Jesus. He was an eyewitness, his own failures, part of this story. But witnesses do more than just take in information. They also testify. Peter often speaks about the sufferings of our Messiah. If, if we belong to him, so we're, we're also called to be witnesses who, like Peter, will share in the glory of Jesus when he returns to this earth. So Peter tells church leaders, be shepherds. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them. You know, reading this in light of John 21, <laughs> where Jesus commissions Peter, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. <laughs> and Peter now addresses these other leaders and says, be shepherds of God's flock under your care, watching over them. When, when the Bible speaks of leadership, two themes stand out, two, two word pictures that describe what is leadership to be about. True leaders are described as shepherds and as servants. This runs through both Old and New Testaments. When, now, when, today, when we think of shepherding leadership, we usually picture something narrower than what the Bible intends. The Latin word, not that, the Latin word for pastor, no, the Latin word for shepherd is pastor. So we naturally think of a certain leadership position in the church when we think of a shepherd. So you might picture a bald guy in his 50s who preaches a lot who spends more time up on the platform than most other people. But in the Bible, all kinds of leaders, judges, kings, prophets, priests, are called shepherds. So when Peter says, be shepherds of God's flock that's under your care, he's calling leaders to function in a certain way. What do shepherds do? They protect they provide for, and they guide their sheep. You can sum up almost everything that a shepherd does in those three words. They protect, they provide for, and they guide their sheep. You see those themes in the 23rd Psalm? And how does that begin? The Lord is my shepherd. The, lo the Lord is my king. The Lord is my leader. Peter emphasizes that church leaders do not own the flock under their care. So we're different from shepherds who raise fluffy, wool-producing animals. It's God's flock. Mapleview is not my church. It's his. Right? The church does not belong to any one of us. I mean, it's still fair to say, which, which is your church? Well, my church is Maple, but we don't mean it in terms of possession, but that we, we're part of it, right? It's not about ownership. Be shepherds of God's flock that's under your care. So this applies to all who are entrusted with leadership, I believe. Sunday school teachers, mentors, parents, our youth executive team, elders, praise teams, Bible study leaders, parents, anyone who's called to lead others. Be shepherds 
of God's flock that is under your care. So God calls us to watch over his flock. So father should ask, Lord, what is your agenda for my children? And what's my role in that? What role are you calling me to play? A Sunday school teacher should ask, where does the Holy Spirit want to take us in this next year? What's God's heart for this class? What flock has God placed under your care? Might just be one or two people you called to care for. How is he calling you to lead? The how is tremendously important. How do we use the authority and the power entrusted to us? What motivates us to serve? What spirit do we bring to those we lead? So Peter says, be shepherds of God's flock that's under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. So when God gives us an assignment, he normally places a sense of call within us, right? So a call might come from outside us. Right? We, someone might tap us on the shoulder and say, you know what, I think you'd be great for this role or that role. Or, of course, as a, as a parent, it comes when the Lord blesses us with children. If he asks you to lead the junior youth, for example, you, you might not feel 100% comfortable. You might question your abilities. But I expect the Holy Spirit would draw your heart to, toward those young people and give you desire to see them thrive in Jesus Christ. When you step by faith into a place of service, you might discover spiritual gifts you didn't know you had. The call of God may stretch you, but, but often there's a joy and a satisfaction that comes with knowing that the Holy Spirit is working through you, <laughs> you're serving within his will, but still, there are times when God calls us to do something that we don't want to do. There's so much I love about being a pastor, but I'm not always on cloud nine, waiting through my emails or needing to have a difficult but necessary conversation, right? That, that's life. None of us are always passionate about everything God calls us to do, whether it's teaching Sunday school or balancing our checkbook or whatever it is. We get tired. Our enthusiasm goes up and down. There are times when we simply need to be obedient to the Lord. But still, he asks us to serve his people willingly, not simply out of duty. If our heart is not in it, we need help. We need help from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and, and sometimes the Holy Spirit might use others, right? So, so being honest <laughs> about if we're struggling, finding a mentor, you know, often God will use that to, to help us, to encourage us. Maybe we've stepped into the wrong role. Or maybe we need God to realign our heart with his. We need fresh <laughs> wisdom. We need fresh spiritual power <laughs> for the task that he's called us to. Alamai Yosefa worked as a bookkeeper um, at a local Christian high school, and he was an elder in his local church. 1977 was a hard year for evangelical Christians in Ethiopia. When I asked him about his experience of persecution under communism, he said, and he was talking about that year, 1977 and 1978, he said it was a time of the Red Terror. Our members were beaten up and imprisoned. We had to help them by going and appealing to the government to release them. So their, their church leadership team decided that six of them needed to talk to the governor of that region. Alamai said, before we six leaders were nominated to make this approach to the governor, there was fear in my heart. I said, God, don't let the leaders choose me. I'm not ready to face this. Would you blame them? <laughs> but he said, but after I was chosen, I felt strong. I felt happy. The fear went away. I said, thank you, Lord, for the chance to die for you. The idea did not come from my flesh. God put his power in me. God puts his own power in people when he uses them as an instrument. Well, before Alamai and the other leaders left for their assignment, 
They took off their watches, their rings, anything valuable that they might have, wallets probably. And they gave them to their wives because they didn't know would they return. He said, if they imprisoned us, we were ready to be imprisoned. If they killed us, we were ready to be killed. God helped us be witnesses to him and glorify and honor him. Well, that visit turned out well. The governor actually did release some young people who had been put in prison because of their faith, because that delegation went to him. So sometimes the Lord does give assignments that scare us and might tempt us to run in the other direction, like, like Jonah. <laughs> that tempt us to run in the opposite direction. Still, if we're willing, God will meet us. He will refresh us. He will provide what we need as we serve him. So next, Peter addresses motivation. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Well, what does Peter mean by dishonest gain? Well, leaders in the early church had access to the common fund, so there's risk they could misuse this money for their own benefit. So um, whatever trust is, is placed in us, there's always the possibility that we could misuse that trust, isn't there? Now, Peter may also have, have in mind leaders who are financially supported by the church. So it would be especially relevant for those who, like me, receive a salary to support them in their shepherding. Scott McKnight says a British pastor once told him that he didn't like his work. Why then did you get into ministry, Scott asked him. The pastor's answer was cold. My parents demanded it, and now I have no other option. So there he was in his late 50s with no personal motivation to serve others in the name of Christ. He didn't expect to get rich, but he was a pastor only because it provided a salary. That's not sad. <laughs> I wonder, was he effective in ministry? I doubt it. So what motivates us? Are we eager to serve? Next, Peter addresses the issue of power. He says, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And again, this, this would apply whatever that shepherding sphere, whatever leadership sphere the Lord has opened up for you and has called you into. A young father was shopping, was pushing his, his son in a shopping cart who was strapped in the front. The little boy was fussing and irritable. He kept trying to pull cans off the shelf, sometimes would reach into the grocery cart to try to throw groceries out onto the floor. The father, though, seemed calm. As he continued down each aisle, he murmured gently, Easy now, Donald. Keep calm. Steady, boy. It's all right, Donald. Well, mother, a mother was passing by. She was impressed by the young father's peace and patience. She said, you certainly know how to talk to an upset child, quietly and gently. She bent down to the little boy and said, what seems to be the trouble, Donald? Oh, no, the dad said. He's Henry. I'm Donald. <laughs> he understood that his main challenge was not his son, but managing himself. He had to face his own irritability and his own anger before he could hope to calm his son. The well-being of his son was wrapped up in his own for his son to learn and grow Dad needed to lead the way. Actually, he needed to lead by example. Every shepherd carries power. When we lead, we exercise influence. We shape the environment in a way that affects others. For children, 
especially when they're young, no one carries more power than parents. We may not feel powerful, but we carry more power than we realize. How do we use it? What happens when I don't get my way? And we ask this, again, whatever our sphere of responsibility. What happens when I don't get my way? That's a pretty good test to see whether I'm serving out of a desire for power or to, to genuinely bless others and honor God. Do I pout, stew, complain, threaten to quit, <laughs> try to turn the tables? Or do I model the way and love of Jesus? Do I model his character? It's the fruit of the Spirit. They come from me. Peace, love, patience, joy. In case we forget, Peter reminds us that we are under shepherds tending the flock of the chief shepherd, Jesus. Jesus Christ, who will one day appear with a crown of glory for all who serve him. Why do our Sunday school teachers put so much time and energy into their work? Why does our sewing circle executive, or their, our lead, their leaders, faithfully manage materials, set up quilt stands, and prepare devotionals? Why do our treasurers, our finance team, faithfully count and deposit offerings, write checks, keep the books in good order, and propose giving plans? <laughs> no act of love is wasted. No act of love is ever wasted. How does Jesus describe himself in John 10? He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. I lay down my life for my sheep. We're lost without him. All of us. That is our human condition. In Isaiah 53, the prophet says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. In Romans 3, the Apostle Paul laments, there is no one righteous, no, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. What he means there, it's, it's not that people aren't curious about God or not, that there isn't something in us as human beings that longs for him. But because of our sin, it, 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 it doesn't take us far at all. We remain stuck. We remain stuck in our sin, trapped by yeah, our own selfishness. How does God respond? He comes to earth in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, to seek and to save the lost. He lays down his own life. He, the good shepherd, he lays down his own life, beaten and crucified. Isaiah, again in chapter 53, says, Surely he bore our pain and took up our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, our sin. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Do you know Jesus, the good shepherd? Have you received the gift that he offers? Do you trust him? My sheep listen to my voice, he says. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Before any of us are shepherds, we're sheep. We dare never forget that. <laughs> And we never cease being sheep if we belong to Jesus. He is the chief shepherd. Peter urges us to shepherd those of God's flock who are under our care in such a way that when he appears, we will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In Revelation 2, verse 10, Jesus addresses the church in Smyrna. To all the believers there, he says, Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. In Revelation 3, 11, he encourages the church in Philadelphia. He says, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have. And he's, he's, he's speaking about the treasure of faith that they have, the relationship with him. Hold on to what you have so no one will take your crown. 
So there's a crown. There's a reward available to all followers of Jesus. So, so what's Peter describing here in 1 Peter? Is he describing that, or is he describing something a bit different? Like, there's so much we don't know, but, but I like what Ben Witherington says about this. He says, the prize, the prize will not be money. The crown will not be gold. <laughs> it will be the glory of having shared in Christ's mission to humanity, being part of what he's up to in this world. And hearing him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, I've been planning to cover this whole chapter and wrap up the sermon series on 1 Peter this morning, but there's so much packed into these remaining verses. I think we should return to them another Sunday. But as we consider these first four verses, how are you serving your good shepherd, Jesus, the chief shepherd? Whom has he entrusted to you to watch over, to serve? For whom do you care? Are you grateful for that privilege? And of course, in different seasons of life, that looks, looks different doesn't it? The nature of that caring, <laughs> um, the ministry he calls us to, you know, there are points in, in life where kind of serving with hands or, or maybe being in public leadership isn't so easy, but praying, <laughs> praying for people, speaking a word of encouragement, right? There, there's so many ways that, that we're called to to invest in others and to, to be shepherds in, in the flock of God. Are you submitting to Jesus willingly, humbly, as an under-shepherd? How is the Holy Spirit speaking to you through Peter today? Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are our shepherd. Lord, words fail us to describe what you mean to us. The, the depth of the sacri your sacrifice for us. It's hard for us to name all the ways you provide for us, ways you protect us, ways you lead us. Lord, we, we, we thank you that you're at work even beyond what we understand. We, we pray, Lord, that, that you, day by day, would help us to know you better. Help us to, to hear, recognize your voice, and to follow obediently. Thank you for your death and resurrection. Thank you that you seek and save lost sheep. And thank you, Lord, that you give us the privilege of serving you, of serving your people. Lord, we ask that, that you would, by your Holy Spirit, would... would Continue your, your work of shaping our hearts and lives. Empowering us to, to answer your call, to hear your call, to recognize Lord, the specifics of, of yeah, how you're calling us to use the gifts you've given us, how you're calling us to bless others, how you're, you're calling us to give witness to you and your grace and power, the salvation that you offer us in a way that, um, that reflects your heart, in a way that, um, yeah, that's, that truly is faithful, Lord, so that when you appear, when you return to earth, 
Lord, we want, um, we want to be ready. We want to be faithful to you. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. And yeah, thank you, Lord, for um, yeah, the unique, unique ways that you call each of us to live out your, your, your mission. <laughs> Thank you. And we pray, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would be glorified here at Maple View in the ways that we serve you, in the ways that we encourage each other and lift each other up and help us to hear your call. And Lord, we, we pray the same for your church around the world, other congregations in our community. Churches of different denominations and no denomination. We pray, Lord, that that uh, yeah, that you would be glorified through your people. We pray in Jesus' name, Amen.